Today, we're going to be taking a look at this 1982 40 horsepower Mercury outboard. This is the after work garage. I got this outboard with a group of other motors and it's been sitting in my garage for way too long. So it's more than time that we take a look at it and see what problems it may have and see if we can get it running. Taking a look at this outboard, it doesn't have controls with it. So if we do get it running, we're gonna have to get some controls uh, to make it functional. You can also see that there's definitely been some damage to the skeg at some point and someone has bolted what looks to be a prop guard on it and that's just a battery cable cover there. These older motor styles are really cool with the way the cowl works. This is actually metal on top. Um, and to get the engine cowl off, you push this to the side. Uh, there's a little lever down here. And then this front plate pops off. And then this was actually similar in the older Mercury's. The front plate, I think there was a button or something on top or bottom. And then you have these little um, hooks you just unlatch kind of like cooler latches or something. And, uh, and the whole thing springs off. So this is actually a metal band that just goes along around the whole motor here. And it's just held on by those hooks. So as soon as you relieve that spring pressure, it uh, does come flying off. And I wasn't quite ready for that with my other hand since I'm holding the camera. As you can see, we now have access to a lot of the motor, but we still have this top part on here that's uh, solid metal. To get that off, there's just the latch here, and this comes off. So taking a look at this immediately, let's see if we can uh, turn this over. It's a good sign that it turns over by hand, but I gotta be honest, I'm not feeling it. Oh, there's some resistance. There we go. Okay. So we'll have to definitely do a compression test on this, but at least the crankshaft is not seized up. Next thing I kind of want to take a look at just to see if the shifter works, and that would be a lower unit issue if there are any, but you can see the prop shaft turning freely without the motor turning, so it's in neutral right now. Um, now let's see if we can get it into gear. So if we look down here, there's this bar, this, uh, I don't know if you can see that, there's a lever, and this is our shifter. So you push it one way, and now the prop shaft should be linked to the motor. So that looks like it's in forward. And as we turn the motor over here, the prop shaft is turning. So that's also good news. Let's see if we can put it in reverse. I'm not sure I can, I can get that with one hand. Let me set you down for just a sec. So it looks like reverse works also, so that's good. Next thing I'm gonna do is take a look at the spark plugs. And they look, you know, used, like spark plugs. I'll probably have to get new ones. All right. There we go. I'm going to set these to the side. So as you can see here, this motor is an electric start. It has a starter motor on it here. The little Bendix gear engages the flywheel. Um, the spark plug's out and everything. I'm actually going to see if the starter motor works. And since I don't have controls, I'm just going to direct hot wire it to a battery for just a second. To test the starter motor, I'm just going to give battery power to this lead right here, which goes to the positive end of the starter motor. Negative's already hooked up to the battery, so let's go ahead and undo this. I don't have the positive hooked up yet. Okay, now the positive lead free and the other end's hooked up to the battery, so I'm just going to go ahead and hit this and see if the starter motor cranks over. And it does. Now that we know the starter motor works, we can move on to doing a compression test. Our compression, we're around about 90 PSI. It's not awesome, uh, but it's not like horrendous. I also saw something with these hanging spark plug wires. I don't know if you could see it, that there was an arc jumping from here to this bolt on the block. Kind of weird to have stray current like that. Just shows you how high a voltage that this is putting out. Also tells me that uh, the coils are probably good. So that's a good sign. Let's go ahead and check out the other cylinder. Uh -oh. 
As it turned out, the thread adapter on the compression tester was too long to allow clearance into the bottom cylinder, but fortunately if I took them all off, the base threading on the compression tester itself uh, fit into the spark plug hole. Alright, here we are. Okay, we're at about 100, a little over 100, maybe 105, almost 110. I don't want to do that top one again. I want to do that top one without that other extension on it. Maybe there was a leak or something, I don't know. Okay, we're at almost the exact same there. That is excellent. Uh, I'm actually pretty happy with that. That suggests to me that this motor is probably pretty healthy. I already saw an arc jumping from this lead uh, to the block. So that suggests that the coil and dis uh, distribution to this spark plug wire is good. Let's take a look at the bottom wire here. Uh, I'm just going to throw a spark plug in there. We're going to ground it to the block and then uh, give us ourselves a test and see see if I can do this somehow here with uh, with you getting to see and without electrocuting myself. Again, you got to be really careful not to. Uh, not to touch, not to be in the path of grounding this thing. So let's give it a shot. And I can see sparks flying from here, here, and everywhere. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that's good. Probably not the best way to do that if I'm honest, um, but it's the way that we're using here. Before I even try to start this motor, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and clean the carburetor. It looks like there is one carburetor right here um, and I'm wondering if I can get it out without taking all of this off, but it doesn't look likely. Uh, the throttle, by the way, looks like it's run uh, off of this arm, which appears to be broken. Uh, so the controls would attach right here, and when you open the throttle, you're pulling this this way. That's pulling this linkage as well as advancing spark down here. And as you're pulling this linkage, you are opening the throttle by hitting that little arm back there. As for the choke, we have our choke right here on the outside. Choke linkage on the inside just closes this bigger valve looking thing over the front. So I think I am going to have to take this off to get in there. I think that's going to entail taking off this bolt, this bolt, this nut, this nut, and then I don't know what else back here. If you're wondering, these are 13 millimeter, and up here these are 11. As are these and uh, this bolt to take the wiring harness out. They're also 11. Immediately put these nuts back on so I don't lose them. I have a habit of losing things like that. Since I'm just trying to get all of this out of the way to gain access to the carburetor, I tried to disconnect as few individual things as possible and instead tried to take things off as units like this coil switch box assembly on top or the wiring harness and terminal block thing on the side. That way I have less to reassemble later and a lower chance of connecting the wrong thing to the wrong place uh, when I'm putting it all back together. Of course that's smaller. Why would it be the same size? Why would it be an 11 when it can be a 10? We all need to remember this guy goes back here. I think this is just a little ground, uh, grounding thing, but actually, what is that? It's like a solenoid. Is that like a uh, auto choke kind of situation? So all we've done is taken the front cover off. This was sitting here supporting the cowl. So you can more clearly see the throttle here as I move the throttle arm linkage. It opens the throttle plate, this arm. Also, the choke linkage here just looks like it rests on spring-loaded and rests on this arm, so we're not going to have to undo anything there. Looks like fuel in is right there, and we have one bolt and two bolts. All right, so I usually like to get the hard bolt first because then you feel like you've accomplished something, but this this might be harder than, than I'm bargaining for here. Need like a super tiny socket. 
can't even get the socket on there. If I could, I could put like a wobble or a, some kind of something. How am I supposed to do this? Come on. Urgh. Makes no sense. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. So you can see the problem is this bolt here. Uh, there's not enough clearance to get it out of the way with a socket, even a little tiny one. And I doubt I can get a wrench in there because this is overhanging it and there's stuff there. But there's these little tiny bolts. Uh, one is here and one is there. And looks like they're quarter inch bolts. I think it's going to let me take the top off of this fuel, whatever it is. I should have done my homework and I could know what's going on with this engine, but... But no later learn like getting in there and just ripping it apart and seeing what you can do. Oh, okay, good to know. The back bolt is a lot longer than the front bolt. So this is raised up here and it's not raised up there and the bolts uh, correspondingly are different sizes. Okay, so I think I just figured out what this thing does. It's a big hunk of metal um, and the thing on the front plate here is a solenoid and Together, when that's energized, it sucks this big hunk of metal up, and as it does it, it closes the choke. So that looks like it's just an auto choke. So manual choke is here, electronic choke is going to be right there. Interesting. Oh, I see. There is a nut back there. Choke plate and choke solenoid. There we are. Oh, is this the this is the carburetor bowl here on the side? Interesting. Okay. So I think we're gonna want to take this hose off. Oh, I can't get to that hose clamp because the starter motor is in the way. Please don't make me take the starter motor off. Let's see if I can get in here. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Look at that. We've got it. We got the socket on. We got the thing moved out of the way. Life is good. And the big reveal or removal. I guess I should be a little careful because of that. Throttle plate, huh? Lift this guy up. Move him out. And we have a carburetor. Whew! That was a little more of a fight than I was hoping for. But, you know. Okay, here's our float. This is our carburetor bowl on the side. Here's our float. Um, it looks it looks real dirty in there. It looks real dirty everywhere. That float's stuck in there. Oh, and I just pulled a spring out. I just pulled this little spring out when I was trying to get the float out. Okay, well, we'll, we'll have to get a carb kit for this anyways. But with that off, now we can access this hose clamp that I couldn't get to before. So here's the top of the carburetor bowl. And whereas normally you'd have a float, you know, sticking off this way that would float up and close things, it looks like that one just has a spring on the top that pushes up and down on this needle. In there, there's our needle that closes off the fuel supply coming from the gas tank, or the fuel pump, rather. Let's take a look at this carburetor here. We have the choke assembly, again, uh, with this auto choke looking thing, and a little cover plate and spring. Uh, I'm going to set this aside for the time being. Looking at the main uh, body of the carburetor, this is really light. This is, like, exceptionally light. Uh, we have the face that mates up to the um, engine block. The gasket actually stayed on the engine block. And we have the butterfly valve and a bunch of, well, crud in there, so it'll be good to at least clean that out. And then we have the carburetor float uh, down here. It looks like there's something in there, and when I tried to get it out earlier, I couldn't. I'm wondering if it's jammed in there or if it's tied in somehow. And that's how it's supposed to be. But that definitely looks like a foreign object to me. Oh, yep, there it answers that question. Okay, so there's our float. This is 
looks like a broken piece of metal and plastic, so I'm not sure quite what that's from. It's more like the metal here. Oh, here it is. This came from this. I'm wondering if I did that or if it was like that. Since it's on the outside, it's not going to affect the seal. Um, but good to note. This carburetor looks like it's seen better days. Doesn't look like it's in bad shape, just really needs cleaning, especially if we look at the air intake here. There's all sorts of dirt and grime spattered in there, and whether that happened to it running or not, definitely we want to clean it out, because you can see the Venturi there. Uh, that would be the main jet down at the bottom. Sucks fuel up through here into the engine. I'm not a carburetor expert by any means, but uh, I know some of the parts, and hopefully know enough to be able to clean this guy. So I think we're gonna have to wait for uh, the carb kit to get here for me to go farther on this. So let's go ahead and take a look at the engine. Okay, I turned the engine around here uh, just so we, we could get a clear view. Maybe I could get a little better light. But we have the plug where the main wiring harness comes in. We're gonna again have to get a new one of these. This looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pins. So that's gonna be an eight pin design. I'm gonna have to look for something with that. We have our fuel filter right here. We probably wanna change this guy out. Let's take a look in here. Oh, doesn't actually look bad. Uh, probably give it a little rinse out with some clean fuel before we start it up. Even the gasket's in good shape. So we'll set this back there. And then our fuel pump is sitting right here. Yes, we do want to see if our fuel pump is intact. But they don't make it easy to get to these bolts. Look at that bolt down there. That one, that's one you can maybe get a wrench into. I'll have to wait till I get my set of wrenches over here to take a look at that one. So I'm gonna have to wait for the carb kit to come uh, to fully clean out and reassemble the carburetor. And the engine actually looks like it's in pretty good shape as it is. Uh, so I'm happy with that, though it may not make the most exciting video at the moment. Um, I could pop the flywheel off, look at the coils and things. Uh, I think I may um, not do that right now. What I am gonna do is take out the lower unit, just see if, first of all, there's lower unit oil in there. We saw earlier that it was shifting, which is a good sign. Um, and then we can take a look at the state of the impeller, which I'm going to change anyways, so I'm not real worried about like cranking it over for a compression test. But it might give us a good idea of uh, what the cooling system looks like inside without you know, actually taking off all the covers and disassembling everything. So let's go ahead and do that. Thankfully this motor has one of these little things that as you lift it up, you, know, you can pull it up and then lock it in place. This Zerk fitting has seen better days. I don't know what's going on with that, but uh, that's just to grease the turning action on this thing, and it seems to be turning fine, so maybe that's because there's excessive play or slop or something. For the oil, we have the drain hole here and the fill hole here. So what I might do is just take a look at this oil to see how it looks uh, and if there's any in there. In fact, why don't we do that? Well, there's oil in there and there's a magnet here. One thing you can't tell is that the soil smells okay, but it also has a little bit of that greenish hue to it, um, which is a good sign. So this looks like a really good sign that it's uh, at least was changed somewhat frequently. It doesn't look like there's any water in there. It smells like oil should smell. It doesn't smell weird. Suggesting that um, this Gasket and the gaskets in here are probably in pretty good shape. So let's go ahead and take the lower unit off and see what we're working with. All right, so I'm gonna start by removing these 16 millimeter bolts. It looks like we're gonna have to wait until we can drop it down a little bit to take these all the way off. Which is actually kind of helpful because, uh, you know, This one's a 15 mil. These the rest are 16 mils, and you can't have an extension for this one. You need an extension for this one, and you have to use a wrench for these. I don't know. It seems about standard. So I'm not too concerned about this thing falling all the way off because these bolts are still on the side. Oh my! What? 
that a drill bit that fell out of here? I'm assuming this is for the pitot tube, which is uh, for the speedometer, but I still want to break it. Does it come out of the other end? Hopefully I can find what that goes into. But we have a lower unit. So this is curious to me that a drill bit fell out of there when I took it out. An oil covered drill bit. So with the lower unit off, you can see that surrounding the splined shift linkage, the thing that turns to change gears, is a collar with a ramp sort of looking thing on it. And I didn't quite know what this was at first, but it turns out that it's the reverse lock cam. And what this does is, since there's no hydraulic tilt or trim on this motor to hold it up or down, uh, the purpose of this is when you put the motor in reverse, the cam pushes up on a rod in the leg of the motor that locks the motor down to its bracket and prevents it from swinging upwards uh, under the force of reverse thrust. Other than that, this lower unit arrangement looks pretty standard, and there were three bolts holding the water pump housing down around the drive shaft, so I took those off and allowed us access to the impeller. Well, that doesn't look great. Housing looks fine, probably. No. No, housing does not look fine. All right, we're gonna have to order a whole new one of these. Don't know if you can see that, but the inner lip there is all chewed up. Yeah, there's the key in there. I think it should slide off. This this is a ruined impeller, though. Wow. Wow. That's that's real stuck on there. So there's normally a woodruff key in there, which I see. But the impeller should just slide right out. So there's nothing keeping it up and down. It's only keeping it from going around. If we look here, I just cut into that brass that makes up the inner part of that uh, really mangled impeller. Not all the way through, but uh, the disc keeps getting upset with me and exploding. So I'm going to see if I can pry that off. I uh, really was trying hard not to damage the prop shaft there, but um, or rather the drive shaft. But you know, that's not a terribly important part. There's a flat spot in anyways for the woodruff key, so if there's a little itty bitty uh, blemish on there, I'm not too concerned about that. Also, this uh, area down here, I believe, gets replaced um, when I buy a new pump assembly. And anyways, that little nick on there is just in the gasket, so. Ah, there we go. Got a screwdriver in there, a big screwdriver with enough force I can bend it apart. I really don't see what the problem is. Normally these things just slide up without any trouble. This one I could not pry it up and it was just really on there, so I ended up having to cut it off. This is the plate, the little divider plate that uh, actually directs the water. This looks very similar to most other outboards, except for that hole there. And the fact that there's two sides here. Let's get this guy off. With this base plate removed here, you can really get a sense of how this water pump works. It looks basically like um, any other outboard water pump, you know, with the veins, uh, just a vein rotor pump. So in this engine, water comes up through this hole, which is the intake, you know, down at these uh, intake fins or intake holes. It comes up through here, up through this hole, and then is swept across this. And you can see there's a little wall here, so water can't just go straight from this chamber into that chamber. Uh, it comes up through this hole, across the wall, which is under here, and then down into this hole, which uh, is uh, this cavity here. And then that uh, gets forced, there's nothing here, uh, but it gets forced up through this hole and then subsequently up to the engine. So until we get the carb rebuild kit and the impeller kit so that we can get this thing fired up and see how it runs, I think that's going to be it for now. Uh, we'll have to do all that in part two, but thanks for watching and I will catch you next time on the After Work Garage.